it, when you just walk out there, you might not see very much. But if you take the time to look a little bit deeper, you'll see that there's an incredible amount of life there and a surprising amount of diversity as well. Where we're standing today, right now, uh, we would be about 10 meters underwater at high tide. So a long ways up, almost 30 feet. This is not just muddy water. There are fish in it. It's not just, when the tide comes in, it's not just, you know, water. We walk it out onto the tidal flats for two kilometers before coming back. So I hate to love it because it's hard work, but it's a great time. Hello, I'm Tom Murphy. Welcome to Land and Sea. The tides of the Bay of Fundy are a remarkable force of nature. The sheer volume of water that passes through here every day is breathtaking. But when the tides are low, a new world is left exposed. And for the people who live, work and study on the Minas Basin, these mudflats are a constant source of wonder. The Minas Basin is an inland sea located at the upper end of the Bay of Fundy. Its modern name originates from the original French map from the early 1600s. It labeled the region as a great area for mineral wealth, hence the name Bay des Mines. It was later anglicized to Minas Basin. But long before the arrival of the French, it was known by the Mi'kmaq as the land of Guscap. It's the home of the creationist story of the founding of the people themselves. Trevor Gould first heard the story as a child. He's an assistant curator at the Mi'kma'we DeBert Cultural Center. So it takes three lightning bolts to create Guska. He's a giant as well, so he creates these giant animals, beavers, and moose, and bears. When he was shrinking all the animals, and he gained the beaver, he shrank all the beavers except one, and one got away. Gluskat finds out that there's a huge dam, and the water's reaching up to the point of vomiting. That's how high it floods. So Gluskat, all he has is his paddle, and with one swipe of his paddle, he knocks the dam up. Water rushes inland, creating these high tides, and that's when beaver is making a gun for it. He picks up mud and stone, and he flings it out into the water. Misses Beaver. But in doing so, when he threw out the clay and the rocks and it landed out into the water, it created what is now known as Five Islands. In many ways, even after thousands of years, the mudflats have remained unchanged. Every day, the tide comes in and out. That means some of the oldest traditions still work today. This is a porter weir. It's built for one purpose, to use the tides to catch fish. It's a massive structure. It's 10 feet high and has two wings of approximately 1,000 meters and 700 meters. The wings slope to a catchment box, or trap, as it's called. It's a commercial weir supplying bait fish to the lobster industry. Erica Porter runs this weir. She's just 21 years old, but is dedicated to this traditional way of life. We're the only weir on this side of the Minas Basin. There's some in Pyersboro, um, Economy, Five Islands, but here we're the only ones, so we're here twice a day every day from March to August. This rugged life comes easily to Erica. My dad's been doing it ever since I could remember. He's always been fishing, so it's always been around me, so it just came naturally. Good. It's a low tide weir. Um, it's structured to the ground. It doesn't move. The fish come to us. Um, we don't search around for the fish. Once it's set in, that's where we are for the season. In about five hours, this trap will be completely immersed in water. Um, and so that's when, and then when the tide is leaving, that's when we catch our fish. It's designed in a V shape, so when the fish in the current is going through, they will uh, funnel, I guess, into our trap. There's a lot of excitement around the weir this morning. The trap is full. I wasn't expecting this today at all. We didn't get much yesterday, so I wasn't expecting this. 
I thought we were going to come out here and catch like 400 pounds. We probably have about 1,015. We keep shad, gaspro, herring is our main species, flounder, tommy cod, squid, um, mackerel. This is a good problem to have, but she still has to sell them quickly. She's now under immense pressure to find a buyer. Hi, um, how are you guys like with fish? Can you take any more of our fish? Well, on the lot right now, we have 2,000 pounds or something like that, and we probably got at least 1,000, 1,500 in the trap right now. We thought our buyer was coming today, and uh, I guess they're not. While Erica Porter searches for a buyer and pitches in with the harvesting process, she still has time to support a group of young scientists doing a baseline fish survey for the Minas Institute of Natural and Academic Science. The species that we will throw out, we still want to count because of our uh, study. So it's still recorded even though we're not keeping it. Butterfish. So like this guy, we don't keep this guy, but we want to measure and record them. So. It's definitely the first time I, that anyone's ever done a baseline study of everything through this weir. So fork length. Carrie Wood is a researcher on a baseline study of the catch in the tidal zone. She loves the work and joins in the excitement of some of their more valuable finds. So we had this one salmon that was what, a foot and a half? It was about there, least, yeah. And that was 100% the coolest thing probably this year we've seen. Two people, right? The other day we caught a spotted hake so. and that when I was looking up it said it's been more than a century since it was recorded in Halifax. Of course they're around but no one's been catching them, right? So we caught one and that's just the coolest thing because then you have that record of it, you have the length, you have, you have pictures, you have, it's documented. So. Um, and seeing like all the sturgeon, so we've been getting quite a bit of um, smaller baby sturgeon, juveniles. Today, they have to wrangle two sturgeon, which are sometimes called living fossils because the species is millions of years old. They need to do their work efficiently to get them back into safe water as quickly as possible. Oh, we'll measure the sturgeon. They have a fork in their tail, so she'll do two measurements, a fork and a total. Did you get it? One, two, one, six, two, zero. six, zero. One, four, six, zero. One, four, six, zero. And that's all in millimeters? Yeah. And so we take them down to our holding pond so that they can swim there and be happy until the tide comes back. The sturgeon will stay in the pond until the incoming tide allows them to swim away. While the study continues, the pressing business of harvesting carries on. Erica has finally found a buyer for her exceptional catch and arrangements are made to get them to market in quick time. Okay, all right, thank you. Okay, bye. I said, yeah, I got it sold and he said, awesome. But for Erica, running this weir on this mud flat means much more than just catching fish. Yeah, I think it's cool that um, we're doing something that not many people do, but we're bringing the community get together and showing people that this is not just muddy water. There are, you know, fish in it. It's not just when the tide comes in. It's not just, you know, water. Look at them all. Oh my God. There are more than just fish in this mud soup. Coming up, we'll see how tiny creatures in the mud provide nourishment for the whole ecosystem. Very important food item for a lot of a lot of vertebrates that are in the system. Here in the Bay of Fundy, off the coast of Nova Scotia, migrating animals use the Minas Basin as a fertile summer feeding ground. These nomads visit for short periods of time, but their refuge here is essential to their survival. The Bay of Fundy, and particularly the upper part of the Bay of Fundy, is biologically connected to all of the North and South Atlantic by the movements of these animals. That makes it important for people to understand that this is a very special place that we have to take very great care of. Graham Dayborn is an emeritus professor at Acadia University. He's fascinated by the history of the Minas Basin and how its origins can be traced through prehistoric oyster fossils back to a specific event 
9,000 years ago. We find shells like this buried in some of the deeper mudflats where it seems in all likelihood that they were suddenly killed by a vast input of sediment that, that smothered them essentially. That sort of reflects the glue scap story in that it was a relatively sudden event that uh, changed the Minas Basin. This change is still felt today through the powerful tides that scour and shape the basin's floor every 12 hours, leaving a land of low mudflats and tidal prairies. It's difficult looking at this water to see what's in it, um, and yet under the surface there, there is a vast array of, of fish and other animals that are, that are coming in on the rising tide and then leaving as the tide goes again. When the tide is down, over the next six hours, all of that water is going to leave. And when it goes down, you begin to see these enormous extents of brown mud. We refer to them as the mud flats, which um, are, appear to be lifeless to most people's uh, view, but in fact they're enormously rich. To my mind, there's no doubt that it's the tides that, that drive the ecology of this whole system. The power of these tides demands respect from anyone who strays from the shore. The, the fact that the tides are rising as much as um, 16 meters in a six hour period means that anybody moving around in this environment has to be extremely aware of the tides and because it can be very dangerous. The dangers of the tides are lost on the thousands of migrating palmated sandpipers who treat the basin at low tide as an unlimited buffet. During the summertime is this appearance of as many as two million shorebirds. This semi-palmated sandpiper uses these mudflats as their only feeding stop on their migration from the Arctic to South America. The basin is so fertile that they can double their body weight in three weeks. I'll try to get some cores, Eileen, and um, try to keep the, the mud flats are also a desired destination that. for local researchers. Dr. Glennis Gibson teaches at Acadia University. She's the lead researcher on two major projects underway here on the Minas Basin. Today, she's leading a group of young scientists on a fact-finding excursion. They're looking for invertebrates found in the mud flats. Oh, this is a fabulous mud flat, yes. It's very healthy and the marsh grasses look great. There's a huge amount of snails. The corophium are fabulous and it just smells really good. It's a, it's a, nice, it's a nice mud flat. The reason why this tidal flat is such a wonderful environment is there's still pockets of uh, very healthy salt marsh here and the unusual deposition of sediments has made this a really good environment for a little mud shrimp called corophium. Yeah, there is a little bit more water over here for doing the sieving and I can hear some corophium. If you listen really closely, it sounds like rice, a bowl of Rice Krispies and when you step, you can see them crawling on the surface. Oh, nice. I can see them from here. I know. They're so ah, it's a female. Oh, so exciting. <laughs> Look at them all. Oh my gosh, when you s splice it, there's ah! so many. It's so exciting. It's a very important food item for a lot of a lot of vertebrates that are in this system. There's a really big crofium here and here. And then there's a bunch of little ones crawling around. You might see them. Oh yes, there's the lots edge. there and there's quite a few over here. Wow, that's great. The big ones are probably females and they brood their young and release little juveniles which is an interesting strategy here because it helps them, the offspring stay next to mom and they don't get washed out in the currents. This research team is focused on their work but when they are below the high water mark they keep a close eye on the tide, especially when it starts returning to the shore. When the tide is coming in it clips along at a very good walking pace. There are places where you can get caught where there's some deep channels with very, very soft sediments and you can't necessarily see them, so it would be very dangerous. The action of the tide on the soft sediment produces a mud-filled watery soup. It's Chrissy? messy work, but it's a rich source of essential data for master student Eileen Haskett. 
I'm seeing how changes in suspended sediment concentration, so grains that are flowing through the water, how changes in that concentration affect the invertebrates, so all the worms and crustaceans that are in the mud. The finer sediments are usually deposit closer to shore and coarser sediments are farther out just because they're carried in with the tides. There's about 450 different species of animals, invertebrates that live in the mud. Some of them have really wide distribution, some are really specialized and indeed are endangered and their habitats are um, at risk of being lost through coastal erosion. Once we get back from the field, we are covered basically from head to toe in mud. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if there's worms and snails on us as well. <laughs> Back in the lab, where it's clean and dry, the detailed work of sorting and cataloging the invertebrates begins to take shape. These are the mud shrimp that we got, and um, the larger one is a female, and all these smaller ones are males. The little curly ones are ketazoni, and they can be very abundant, right, Eileen? Like six or 7,000 per square meter? Yeah. Although the lab work is crucial to the science, it's the beauty of the Minas shore that compels these researchers. There was one point last summer we were all standing around collecting samples and a flock of sandpipers flew around us and we couldn't get over how much of a Nova Scotia experience it was. It was amazing. Even after all these years, Graham Dayborn still has his sense of wonder about the mudflats. It's been the most fascinating set of challenges to be out on the mudflats in the middle of the night um, trying to understand um, how animals live there, what the conditions are like. It is endlessly fascinating because there are a few other places in the world where you could do that. Therefore I think we have a stewardship responsibility to look after this environment. Um, not only for ourselves, but for a whole lot of other people who share the same fish and birds that we do. Coming up, digging for dinosaurs on the Minas Basin. This is where Canada's oldest dinosaur bones are found, just down the beach. And the rocks that are exposed here at the, on the intertidal zone are of the same age. They're 200 million years old. Every day, as the tides come in and out of the Bay of Fundy, new and ancient worlds are revealed. Tim Fedak is the curator of the Fundy Geological Museum. He has a keen interest in both the living and the dead. Today, he's on his favorite shore called Wasson's Bluff, where the ancient sandstone is continually washed by shifting mud. So where we're standing today, right now, uh, we would be about 10 meters underwater at high tide, so a long ways up, almost 30 feet. And it's, it's almost like a little bit of a rainforest on the ocean floor. And it also happens to have uh, some really interesting geology. This is an explorer's dream, an accessible land of both the ancient and the present. So this is where Canada's oldest dinosaur bones are found, just down the beach. And the rocks that are exposed here at the, on the intertidal zone are of the same age. They're 200 million years old. So what we're going to see here at Two Islands is uh, where the Atlantic mud pittock lives. And it's isolated to a very small little zone of the low tide area. The tide has to be out a certain amount before you can see it. And they're also limited to burrowing into the rock, the sandstone, that is the same rock that the dinosaurs' bones and footprints are found in. The Atlantic mud pittock is a small clam that burrows into the sandstone and settles in for the long haul. Uh, other clams in sand that can move in and out and they can move a little bit, this one is going to be here for the rest of its life. They're at risk because they need this type of sandstone to burrow into and that this type of sandstone is limited to this area. At a rock laboratory in Parsboro, Tim Fedak examines an ancient rock from the Wassons Bluff area. It reveals solid proof of the relationship between dinosaurs and these burrowing clams. This is a dinosaur footprint here, those three toes, and the foot actually slid a little bit before it, while it was taking a step. 
But if you notice, this specimen has a hole in it and a burrowing clam had uh, made this hole just recently. So it was burrowing into this sandstone, which is 200 million years old. But this hole was created by the Atlantic mud pittock. We're just now starting to map out where they're found and uh, trying to protect them a little bit because they are in, uh, a bit threatened because they're limited to this specific rock that they burrow into. Not all clams are as hardy as the mud pittock and need better living conditions than the sandstone. A few miles down the shore, they thrive in the softer mud flats. Following the circular indents in the mud, these harvesters are like the oldest of the hunter-gatherers who followed the patterns of the tides. They are commercial clammers who make their living off the rich nuggets hiding just below the surface. The clams are rinsed, delivered to a local processor, and then marketed throughout the world. Meanwhile, the tides continue their rhythm. Erica Porter is back at the weir with her team. We're definitely family. Working twice a day every day from March until August creates a family, definitely. Although night has fallen, the tide will return in a few short hours. This never-ending cycle keeps the Minas Basin rich in life and a constant source of wonder. I like this, and the sunsets are my favorite part. I can't take enough of them.